you know, <laughs> I, I really can't explain it except it's an addiction. I first started, I would sit 30, 40 minutes an hour just like we're sitting here and I would watch a beehive. I'd watch the bees go in and out. I'd watch the little legs be full of pollen and then they'd come back out there empty. I'd watch some of them come in uh, fanning the place. I'd watch some of them pushing other bees out. Uh, it was just, it's just fascinating. And then when you take the thing apart and you look, the brood is there, the honey's there, uh, the pollen's there. I don't know, it's ridiculous. It, it's, it's great. It's not like it used to be in, you know, I don't know how many people I've talked, well, my dad or my grandpa used to do this. Yeah, because that's what you did. You were in an agronomy situation and that's part of what you did for your food source. Now then, you do it because you like it. I'm right now attempting to mentor a 12-year-old Boy Scout for not just his merit badge, but keep him interested in bees. We need more beekeepers. Well, without beekeepers, a lot more bees would be dying. And bees make up like, they like pollinate like most of the plants and wouldn't have very much food with, without bees. Honeybee that we think of is not a native insect. It's from Europe. There were no honeybees here in the United States in 1400 or before then. Uh, so beekeepers have been very effective at managing them to provide uh, pollination services for our big agricultural crops, whether it's almonds in California or melons in Texas or blueberries in Maine. Wherever you are, beekeepers are there uh, providing these very, very good pollinators. Before these European bees were brought here, before the honeybee was brought here, there was a whole suite of thousands and tens of thousands of other pollinating insects, many different species of bees, uh, which are native to the United States, and they were here pollinating things before the honeybees. But what we have done now is to create a highly integrated agricultural system that requires, uh, that has intense crops uh, packed in, and it really requires these very efficient pollinators of the European honeybees that we brought in. So they're essential for our agriculture today. We have to have them. Um, if we lose some of their services, it's going to be pretty hard to replace them. Our first hive was down there and uh, there was some honey left over from the winter because it used to be like bigger and there was more honey in it. It was darker honey, but it was still good. There are two million beehives roughly in the United States today, plus all the feral bees that are out there. Um, there are thousands of beekeepers that are still keeping those, and they're supported uh, by university uh, faculty that are trying to come up with research that helps them figure out how to sustain their bee population in the face of these mites and various stressors, uh, fungi, diseases, viruses, and things like that. So there's been a good partnership between the state uh, universities, the federal government with U.S. Department of Agriculture providing research to try to support beekeepers, and then just, you know, family traditions. Uh, one person passing along information, equipment to somebody else in the family or a friend of the family and getting them started. So it's, it's been a really very nicely distributed kind of thing, not really organized by large scale industry, although there are big players in it that are responsible for a lot of honey production and uh, pollination of the more valuable crops. I have an uncle in Oklahoma City who was a beekeeper uh, had 21 hives at the time. He was a member of the Honey Board, National Honey Board. He actually leased the rights to put bees on Will Rogers World Airport. So when he left his bees there for two years, he asked me, would I like to have them? Well, sure. So uh, we went up and got them. I took them out, started with uh, seven hives. Uh, ended up with none due to ignorance but that's how I got started.
Bees are the most organized species of insect that there is. They have workers, they have guards, they have bees that air condition the place, they have bees that feed the queen, they have bees that feed the babies. They are just a col every colony and every bee has its own job. They don't complain, they just do it. First of all, they're gonna protect the queen. She's gonna live her life in, inside the hive entirely. Like this cold weather we had last night, they all collect up around that queen, probably in the upper part of that hive over there, and they kept moving around that queen, and the friction from their wings kept it to be 70 degrees or so around that queen to save her. That's their mama. <laughs> the bee colony is organized as a superorganism, and we can really think about them in a way that we think of an individual. So a whole colony of 30,000 bees plus a queen in a way, we can think of like an individual animal, the same thing as a cat or a dog or you or I or something like that, where the individual bees don't have a life that's independent of the colony, in a sense. We can think of them almost as cells in our own body. Uh, and they cannot reproduce, they cannot be healthy, they cannot uh, maintain their existence as they do in a healthy colony without a queen. There is communication within the colony um, and we're finding out more and more about that with each passing year which is a chemical communication based on a whole suite of different pheromones that the queen produces, that the worker produces. There's all sorts of nuances of chemical communication that we're just beginning to understand. There are wonderful dances that the bees do, the foraging bees do, within the hive, in the darkness of the hive, that lets the other workers, the other foragers know exactly where a rich source of nectar is. It may be a half a mile, it may be two miles away, and yet that bee is able to communicate in the darkness of the hive exactly where that source is, so the other foragers can fly out and find that nectar source. So there's wonderful communication that's going on inside there. And in a way, it's sort of like thinking about an organism that has a brain and a nervous system with the communication that has to happen between all the different organelles and organs um, of our bodies in order for us to function as an organism. In the same way, we can think about a colony of bees as being much more complex and having to have all of these connections in order to sustain itself as a super organism. Bees collect nectar from the flowers that they go into. It's a liquid. And they store that nectar in a special stomach. And they come back into the hive and they deposit that liquid nectar in those spots, in those beeswax. And then they dehydrate it. They take the water out of it. And you, that's why you see in the summertime, you see bees out front their little hind ends sticking up and their wings just flapping like crazy because they're using that for dehydration. Then they cap it with wax and that's how it's kept till it's used by the bee or somebody like myself comes in, cuts the caps off and steals their honey. <laughs> A good strong hive in the summertime is going to have 60, 70,000 bees, maybe 80. Depends on the size of the hive. I have one out at Francis that's six supers tall, and I suspect it has a bunch of them in it. Uh, this hive back here in this red, white, and blue thing is a fairly gentle hive. This and around there on the other side of the trailer over there, uh, they don't really like you being around them. I don't know why that is, it's just, just the way it is. So. I know I take smoke to all of them and sugar water every time I go. <laughs> smoke, for it calms the bee. Actually, it makes the bee think that there's a fire and all the workers and everybody go inside and they start gorging themselves on honey. So if there's a fire, they can take off. I remember one time me and my dad were working on some over here on this hill, on that over there, and there was a real, there's an aggressive hive over there. And my dad took uh, one of his gloves off and he got stung a couple of times. I've never heard a, 
my dad scream like that. <laughs> Wasn't screaming like a girl or anything, but he was pretty shocked. I have a log in my, up at my house where we cut it down, cut right in the middle of a beehive because the guy that was trimming it, he was he's gonna get rid of this bees. Well, he cut right in the middle of the hive and he left his saw and his gas and everything else there until he decided he could go back safely. I'm out working the beehive uh, at Fitzhugh one day and have my bonnet on and somehow or another I folded my shirt up in such a way that a bee one at a time could get through there. When this year began to get warm and I knew there was buzzing, I started walking away. Long story short, I had 19 stings here and 49 on the back of my neck. I still can't find my hive tool. I don't know what happened to it. Well, we were done working with the bees, and I thought we were over, and I had my dad brush all the bees off my suit, and I thought I was clear, and I took my hood off. And I was doing good, but a couple, like, bees, I guess, came to check me out, see what I was doing. Then one got under my eyeglasses, and uh, I pulled my eyeglasses off, and it stung me. That hurt a lot. <laughs> To a person who is uh, allergic to them, they are severely dangerous. If you're allergic to uh, a bee sting, a wasp sting, it can take your breath, literally close up your throat in less than five minutes and you can die. Most of the time we carry an EpiPen. I don't happen to be allergic to it now, but uh, if I were, I'd have an EpiPen if I felt it coming on, I'd just give myself a shot through the britches and it would loosen things up. Yeah, so bee venom is a, is a complex venom, but one of the main uh, components in it is uh, melaton. And uh, it can be used to uh, reduce swelling in joints, uh, treat multiple sclerosis, uh, arthritis, uh, bursitis, a whole array of other kinds of things like this. The first thing you'd have to be careful about is whether or not you're actually allergic to bee venom. Because if you are, then you can very quickly experience anaphylactic shock and you have to end up in the hospital or you could be dead, basically. So, you know, you need to be very certain that you are not allergic to bee venom. But if you're not allergic to bee venom and you are tolerant of this, uh, the application of melaton can actually have some therapeutic effects where other things have not had therapeutic effects. It seems to be uh, pretty good at treating things like Lyme disease, which is amazing, you know? And so it has some very powerful uh, antibiotic properties. This is all honey. Bees produce the most perfect food that there is. Honey is the most perfect food that there is. If you don't add anything to honey, it will never spoil. Well, honey is basically about 79% fructose. So it's really, really high sugar, very sweet. It uh, doesn't spoil if you keep water out of it. It basically uh, has antibacterial, antibiotic properties which means it's, it's a food that can be maintained for a long period of time. Uh, over a very long period of time, most honey will crystallize, like from uh, alfalfa, for instance, or from dandelions. Things like that will crystallize very quickly. Honey from other plants like locust, for instance, uh, can maintain um, in a liquid state for a much longer period of time. Local honey has to be within the distance of the flight of the bee are a very similar uh, ecosystem. If we got honey from California, we got honey from Kansas or Texas, it's not going to do the same thing if we got honey from Fitzhugh or Francis or Lightning Ridge. Those are the pollens that cause our allergies. So having that honey from there, it does help it. Honey's always been seen as sort of a luxury food. In, in ancient times, it was sort of restricted to the royalty because it was so sweet and so delicious and so hard to come by, really. 
Um, it's been said to have uh, medicinal properties. It does have some uh, antibiotic properties, so still hospitals today, some hospitals are using it in, in various wound dressings. Uh, it, has, uh, it can kill off uh, infectious bacteria, it can help close wounds, um, so it's good that way. But I think you have to be careful about saying it's a complete food. You certainly wouldn't want to just live on honey alone. And in fact, too much honey can, uh, can be bad for diabetics. It can produce uh, insulin resistance. So I would say a little bit of honey every day is a great idea, but slathering, you know, a double sandwich of honey and butter each day, probably not the best thing for your metabolism. I can't raise enough honey. I have, to, I, peop, I have people call me right now saying, Ernie, do you have honey yet? We have a local doctor here who has a son who has bad allergies. She found out I had honey last year and she came and bought a case. And before the year was over, she wanted to buy more. It, it, it works for him. I can't tell you that it works because I'm not a medical doctor. But I can tell you what worked for me and her testimony to it. Uh, I can just walk down the street of Ada with a jar of honey under my arm and I can sell every one of them I've got. It probably comes from this idea of uh, if you expose yourself to small doses of whatever is going to cause allergies from anything like poison ivy, a snake bite to various other pollens and weeds and things like that, that a little bit of that will help to desensitize your system so that you don't have an allergic response to it. And you see this in people taking poison ivy pills to try to ramp up for exposure to poison ivy later on. In the same way that people say if you know that you're going to have hay fever, you know, you might try exposing yourself to a low dose of the pollen early on and see if you can kind of desensitize your system. That can work. You can also have the opposite effect of producing hypersensitivity by early exposure to that. So I would, I would say that one needs to be taken with a grain of salt. I have a tablespoon of honey, one tablespoon every day, faithfully, every day. It helps me sleep, maybe psychological, but it helps me sleep. An older queen that is no longer useful will be sort of rejected at one point in time and the new queen will take over. And usually the new queen will uh, run the old one out. And sometimes they just clip her wings and kick her out, which she can't fly so she dies. Sometimes she's well enough to take a swarm with her and she says, okay girls, come go with me, we're gonna go start somewhere else. And that's where a swarm comes from. Like I said a while ago, a swarm in a tree is freebies. <laughs> Sometimes the bees will be attracted to this thumping because the queen moves around in the hive and begins to ball up a little bit. So her pheromone begins to dissipate a little better, spread out a little more. y'all. We'll find your other mama. <laughs> the natural predator that we have around here are dragonflies. Dragonflies like to eat bees and uh, that will be the, the main predator if any at all. However if the swarm is strong enough and the bees are protected the dragonfly don't have a chance. Well, the average life of a bee in the summertime is maybe four, five, six weeks. Uh, they'll start off uh, when they hatch from a cell. Uh, they'll work in the colony initially, uh, grooming and feeding the queen, and also taking care of young bees, feeding the other bee larvae. And then eventually, by about the second or third week, they move outside of the colony and they become foragers, and they go out and find flowering areas and start bringing in the nectar. Uh, and then eventually, after about the fifth or the sixth week, they'll die off. But they, each evening, uh, they need to be back inside the hive. 
outside the hive, they fall prey very rapidly to uh, spiders, uh, birds, a whole array of just sort of uh, physical world challenges. They'll die overnight. So uh, they need to be back in the colony each evening. Colony collapse disorder was discovered about six, eight years ago. And uh, a pollinator went to his bees where they were in, in almond fields, and a number of them were just gone. They were gone. They weren't just dead out in the front where they died off. They were gone. They don't know exactly what it is. Most of us feel like it's probably from pesticides being sprayed or there's a pesticide being placed in seeds now that comes up through the roots to the stems, through the pollen producers. And bees and insects, they don't know not to eat that stuff. So if it eats that stuff, it's gonna die. These pesticides have been tested on bees and they were safe for bees at uh, acute levels, high doses. But what people realized was that it perhaps was a story not of killing the bees, but of degrading their health with very low levels of pesticides so that they would basically become disoriented when they left the hive and not be able to return. And that was what the beekeepers were reporting, that, that bees were departing the hive and not coming back. So early on there was a concern about this class of pesticides and then people really started considering more broadly all of the things that were challenging bees. So there's actually a whole suite of stressors on bees now in the United States and really worldwide um, from a couple of bacterial diseases, foul brood, European foul brood, American foul brood, there's a uh, fungus, uh, Nosema, um, there's a virus that's carried by the fungus, there are a couple of really bad mites, a varroa mite and a tracheal mite, and all of these things uh, degrade the health of the bees, but beekeepers have been for decades sort of managing all of those and breeding for bees, getting hygienic bees that could handle the bacterial diseases, that could handle the mites, that could handle all the various stressors. And so something new was happening with this colleague collapse disorder that was causing rapid, large-scale failure of these beehives that had not failed before. So people were really concerned about that. And that's really where it is today. We don't know, we know that uh, these neonicotinoids uh, uh, have a potent effect. We know that these other stressors are there. Uh, we don't have yet a single answer to colony collapse disorder. So it's an area of active investigation right now. I think um, beekeeping is a way of kind of engaging with your local environment and if you are keeping healthy bees and have healthy bees, you really know about the health of all of the flowering plants in your area and you are in touch with uh, various climatic stresses that come through. You know when there's a good honey run, you know when there's a good nectar flow in the surrounding area. They're not as scary as they seem. Honey is a lot better when you get it yourself. <laughs> I'm getting some through my hood. I'd say get a bee suit and be careful. Have someone who knows what they're doing help you. In a way, you, you are harvesting the local flavor of the land because the plants that grow right there where you live are producing a unique nectar, a unique honey that's going to be different from one county or one location to the next. So it is a, a delightfully localized food that really does depend on the local environmental quality and the health that you have where you live there. We need the bees, and they need all the help they can get. But we're all getting old, so we need some youngins like Isaiah and other youngsters and young people, persons, who would become interested in taking care of bees. It's a good avocation. And it is actually a lot of fun, except when you get stung. And you will get stung. View this program again anytime at www.youtube.com slash cityofadaok.